It's 11.30. Is this on? Can you hear me? All right. It's 11.30, so let's get started. It's my pleasure. I'm Joan Ash, by the way. And with uh, Bill out of the country, uh, I am introducing our uh, speakers today. And I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Mark Engelstadt, who's been at OHSU since 2011. We were so lucky to get him. He came to us from Minnesota. And when I was looking at your CV yesterday, I saw he has a DDS, an MD, a master's in health informatics, and he did fellowships in oral and maxillofacial surgery in the US, Switzerland, and Australia. Very impressive background. And even more impressive is what he does here at OHSU, uh, where he's an associate professor in two departments in the School of Medicine, including DMICE, and in the School of Dentistry. Are you still interim chair? Yep, for another two weeks. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. He is presently interim chair of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery in the School of Dentistry. He heads up the residency program for that department, and also he has our informatics fellowship under his wing. And I will let him introduce his fellows in a little bit, but uh, they will be talking about a very exciting project they've been working on. Thanks, Joan. Um, just hearing all that, it made me think I should ask for a raise. I, 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 do, I do a lot. It's, um, before I go any further and talk about an applied informatics approach to a surgical resident log, I want to introduce our other two presenters today who, um, working with uh, Mike and Jeff is, I think, the best part of my job, and it's really what makes me look forward to coming to OHSU and brings everything together, allows me to bring together my clinical world and the informatics world. Um, Mike Grove is a PhD, has a PhD in informatics from the University of Minnesota, and Michael and I actually met when I was a grad student getting my master's. We started our program at the same time. Mike went on to get a PhD and, and then came here to OHSU as a National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research Informatics Fellow, which is really analogous to being an NLM fellow. It's really the same thing, but it's sort of under the auspices of the NIDCR. Um, which is a branch of the NIH that really concentrates on oral um, and uh, craniofacial health. Our other presenter is Jeff Emsch, and Jeff got his master's degree in bioinformatics here at OHSU and just completed it recently, last year, and is now um, a PhD candidate, pre-doc pre fellow. I always get the terminology wrong. He's a pre-doc fellow. Um, also in, under the NIDCR fellowship program. And we really work together as a team on this. So um, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about uh, the whole context behind this. Why did this project get started? How did it make sense? What are we doing? What are the, some of the challenges we came across and are going to come across? And where are we going with this thing? Um, uh, Jeff is going to talk about the architecture of this application that we've built. Mike is going to talk to you about the ontological model that powers the reasoning and the inferencing behind it. And then we're going to give you a demo of this working uh, product. Hopefully we can leave enough time for the demo because that might be the fun part. So how did this all come apart uh, or all come together? <laughs> Well, as, as Joan mentioned, I'm a program director. So I run a residency training program. That's probably my biggest surgical role. And I deal with residents, and I'm an educator. And a big component of residency training for hundreds of years has been the surgical log. That's how residents have always documented what they've done, who they've treated, what disease processes have they managed, what surgeries have they done, what credentials do they have, what privileges can they get. So the log is a constant thing in surgery. But as I got informatics training, I realized the disconnect between the way logs have been kept for the last several decades, which is in billing terminologies like ICD and CPT, which are great if you're going to ask an insurance company for payment. They work wonderfully for that. But they are really bad, well, they are really uh, inefficient representations of what happens in the educational realm what happens in the clinical care realm. 
when one of my residents goes to log a case, and let's say he did a facial artery muscle mucosa flap, a FAM flap, and he says, gosh, I know I did a FAM flap with Dr. Engelstad. I'm going to go and log that now in my log. And in the log, he searches the log, looks for fam flap, looks for fam flap, can't find it, doesn't exist. So then that resident who has you know, a limited amount of knowledge, certainly isn't an expert in billing, is forced to look at the whole list, decide by deductive reasoning which thing on the list most represents the thing that he did. And maybe if he's, he or she is really bright, they will finally settle on the appropriate code, which is, um, rotated flap, head or neck, 10 centimeters or less, which, of course, <laughs> doesn't at all represent what he did. That's sort of a, a generalized term. But that process, cognitively, is extremely fatiguing. You know, when you know what something's called, can't find it, but are forced to search a list for another thing that might represent it. It leads to us saving data that really doesn't represent the real world, and it's really, really annoying for the resident to have to do that. So what we're missing in logs is really structured, granular, clinical domain information. I know what things are called. I say things like, I say, I did a fam flap. I don't go around saying, I really did a great head and neck flap rotated 10 centimeters or less today. You know, I've never said that ever, and none of my residents will ever say that. So let's build tools that actually use the words and phrases that we use. Um, and a tool that really captures the special characteristics of, of educational demands. So what are some of these special characteristics? In this little domain of oral and maxillofacial surgery, which crosses the bridge between dentistry and medicine. Well, one of the special educational demands is that our logs have to generate reports that satisfy accreditation requirements. That's one of the big reasons for keeping a log so that I can accredit my training program, people can site visit me, and I can show them information that says, see, look what we did, look what we treated, we should be accredited. Right now, these accreditation reports can be put on anything, a PDF, Excel spreadsheet, Word document, a paper napkin, whatever you want. Um, and so a goal would be to, to structure the information so that it can be used very efficiently for accreditation, to meet accreditation um, requirements. One really special cool thing about our domain that allows us to do this project that might be much more difficult to do in say orthopedic surgery or general surgery is that because we're accredited by CODA and CODA doesn't make demands on our log, we can experiment with new log formulas. If I was accredited by the American Council on Graduate Medical Education, ACGME, which accredits most surgical training programs, I would have very limited ability to experiment with a log because their log rules are much more restrictive. So because I'm in this little domain, we can experiment. And that's why OMS is such a special place to do this. I am uh, the chair of a committee that is involved in setting up uh, establishing a national resident surgical log. And that committee is uh, um, a part of our American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, which is the national professional committee in my field. So we, we are sort of well positioned to get this product that we're making rolled out to hopefully all training programs in the United States. Another stakeholder in this are the residents. Um, they need to know what they did. They want to be able to use information to go to their program director and say, you know, I don't have a lot of experience in this area over here. How can you help me? Um, right now, they really can't do that. And of course, the educators need information. And when I meet with a resident, I got 20 minutes to sit. I have a half an hour, an hour to sit down with them, devise an individual achievement plan, devise a learning plan. And if my information is really hard to decipher and interpret, then building those plans are really difficult. So it took a long time to develop an actual, you know, idea of what we're doing and how do we bring all these pieces together. It's a grand plan, but this is the, the, our idea uh, in encapsulation. Uh, we hope to develop a standardized oral and maxillofacial surgery training log that's intuitive um, and semantically rich that can improve education, reporting, and clinical research. So we have to take 
events like this, where there's a diseased patient and there's a surgery that's happening, and somehow we have to transmit that very, very unstructured information into a formula that's actually structured. So a lot of times in registries and databases and things like that, people take unstructured information like clinical notes and they make it structured like a database by hiring a nurse or a, a, a study coordinator or somebody like that. Well, nurses and study coordinators are very, very expensive people and they can only work at a certain rate. So one big challenge in building any database is who is going to enter the information? Who's going to read that chart or enter or say what I did to that patient and put it in this special place over here? That's a, a huge problem. Well, we have people who are going to do that, and they're called residents, right? And they're really, really special. And I, re I recognize that log data has so much potential um, and why it's so valuable. It took me a little while. But I realized that, boy, in, in medicine, in healthcare, we are always struggling to find structured piles of data that we can actually turn our informatics tools on and actually find out things, you know, learn things about healthcare and science and medicine. Where is that data going to come from? You know, the, the, the dream of it coming just right out of the EHR certainly hasn't happened. And um, so we are, we are really starving for structured piles of data that we can, we can, we can use. So I realized uh, that these residents are really special. First of all, they're domain experts. They know what everything is called. They don't have to be trained. They don't have to be sent to a course. They know the name of everything, and they know what things are called. They also have a they also overcome one of the obstacles, which is incentive. They have an incentive to enter the data. They're, in, they're competitive by nature. They don't like to be the, the one who did the least. Um, and they have to get credentials, and they have to get privileges. And we live in a world of ever-increasing um, uh, verification. Gone are the days when you can just show a certificate and say, ah, see, I did a residency, and boy, I'm, I'm ready to go. To get privileges and credentials, you have to show people that you are trained to do things, that you are trained to manage specific disease processes. Um, and so they have a high incentive to log their cases if we make it easy for them. And if you think about uh, any database, what you really want is national information. And that's the thing that's super hard to come by. It's possible for you to get information out of OHSU, but if you want to build a database that collects clinical data, educational data, which is clinical data, if you want to build this and organize it and have it come from multiple sources and multiple institutions, that is an extremely complex thing to coordinate and build with IRB limitations and a whole bunch of things. So resident data is really interesting because it is both educational, which is what allows us to pool it all together nationally, but if we collect it in the right way, we can use it secondarily for clinical research. If you were just collecting clinical data, you would have to satisfy a huge amount of IRB limitations before you could collect national clinical information. But we're collecting primarily educational information, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So let's say we had a tool that could peer into a big national database of findings and procedures. Well, what would we want to do with it? I might, as a program director, ask a question like, I want to know how many malignant salivary gland pathologic processes a certain resident has managed. In order for me to ask a simple question like that, the system has to know what's a salivary gland pathologic process and what's a malignant process and how many of it has a certain people, has a certain person done. And, and from an informatic standpoint, that is not easy. I might want to know, is my training program providing adequate experience in, fl in free flap reconstruction compared to national averages? In order to know that, I have to know what national averages are. The machine has to know what a free flap is. Um, and that requires inferencing and reasoning. The resident, another stakeholder, is, may want to ask their program director or may want to know if they need more experience in a certain domain of surgery. Right now, by any log system that exists anywhere, there really isn't any way for a learner to challenge their teacher and say, I am deficient in a certain area. 
um, without spending a, a large amount of time searching their log and maybe collecting information from other places. It's not easy to do. And I think a good log should tell people what you've done and what others have done and where you're still deficient so we can educate people. A researcher might want to query this information and ask, well, when, I, when, used, to tra when, used, to treat when used to treat a finding associated with inflammation of any facial bone structure, are debridement or total excision procedures followed by fewer free flap reconstruction procedures? Now, that's a big question. Basically, that's a, uh, a question that's formed in a, in a very logical way that asks which procedure works better because it's followed by fewer procedures. And um, right now, there are no lo logs that can do that. Or a researcher might want to ask, I'm thinking of building a study. Where can I find patients that have had an excision of one branch of a cranial nerve that also had grafting that were later followed by removal of the graft? It seems like a simple question, but for you to pour over records and logs right now, that would take months just to find out if those patients even existed. So our log takes clinical findings, takes procedures, which are educational events. The motivated surgical trainee logs the finding, logs the procedure into an OMS database. Then we have stakeholders like accreditation agencies, program directors, surgeons, you know, students, surgical residents, or researchers that are going to query the database through an ontology, which can use the information in a database, reason with it, inference it, and give information back to those stakeholders. Our plan is to start in OHSU, obviously, and get this thing working. Then, over the next few years, uh, build a relationship with five to ten other sites that have shown a lot of interest in being part of this project. Um, and then, after working out the kinks that come with working in multiple sites, um, then roll it out to one, hopefully, at least 80 percent of the hundred existing training programs. Right now, there, we already have a national log. So the idea of getting this rolled out to every training program really isn't too pie in the sky because most logs that already exist exist in every training program in that domain or field. Um, and um, with that introduction, I'm going to pass this over to Mike to talk to you about the ontology behind this. And I'll just briefly touch on this, and we'll get into more specific examples from our actual project. But this, just a couple of quick slides for those who are not familiar with the idea of an ontology and what it can do. Um, as Mark said, we're trying to model a complex domain like surgery um, and not rely on these on billing codes and so forth, which, which, which aren't built to understand the semantics of what's occurring in a surgical setting from an educational standpoint and a clinical standpoint. So. An ontology, just at the highest level, is a set of classes or concepts that are related to one another um, using properties. So it allows you, for, allows you to perform inferencing and classification over large aggregated data sets. So a really simplified example here is we can imagine that we're using an axiom in our ontology. In other words, we're making an assertion, a statement about our domain. And we're saying, in plain language, which an ontology is able to speak, uh, speak about a domain in a plain language while simultaneously being machine processable. So, but in plain language, we would say in our ontology that any sense organ that functions in the de detection of smell is an olfactory sense organ. So we have a class sense organ in our ontology, we have a class olfactory sense organ, and we have a property relationship of capable of detection of smell. So we see that the confluence of the two categories result in a new, in a, the class olfactory sense organ. So that's modeled in an ontology in a generic example. So what that can do is if we look at, if we add an instance of a nose, which is a sense organ, into our ontology, and we also annotate it with a, the, the property type capable of detection of smell, you're able to, through classification, infer that the nose is an olfactory sense organ based on the initial model. So we're not, in other words, we're not saying this in the ontology model, but by annotating our data with the ontology model, we're able to infer this. And so it's a really simplified example, but you can imagine over a large, complex data set, this starts to unearth a lot of really uh, detailed knowledge that you just can't uh, figure out through human um, review of that data. Or it's just, you know, it's just it's too complex and too large. 
So that's just that's the basic um, sort of conceptual informatics underpinning of this log, which gives it the, the power that, that makes it pretty cool. And I believe Jeff, I'll hand over to Jeff to talk about sort of the architecture of the whole application. Okay, so we called this a, a blended architecture. And the reason for that is uh, most uh, medical or business transactional systems record transactions and logs and events are transactions, are based more or less on a traditional um, RDB, relational database. Oh, the um, the uh, transactions are, are, the information is read from the database, the transactions are written back to the database. Um, in order to aid our residents in selecting more semantically rich or more granular uh, records or selections for both their findings and their procedures, we've developed a, uh, taking the approach of using what is called a, a triple storm, we'll talk about this in a little while, that is um, based on a solar leucine triple storm. So this takes the place of a database for powering the term selection. Once the terms are selected and the events are written, they are written to the database. And all of this uh, uh, information that powers this uh, triple store is um, driven out of, is extracted from and driven from the ontology that Mike spoke of. Um, and then it uses a typical uh, LAMP-based architecture or stack and that we're using Linux. Uh, this is hosted by ACC. Uh, Linux is the operating system. Um, Apache, we're using both Apache and Apache Tomcat in particular server. It's a Java server page server, so uh, that serves up most of the GUI. Um, MySQL is the database. We're not using the P, normally that stands for Python or PHP or one of these others. In the place we're using uh, pure Java and Java server pages. Um, and it's served out uh, and available just through a standard uh, web browser. Uh, so what is the advantage? Why go to all this trouble? Um, so pop-up lists. Pop-up lists for everybody and in particular for residents when they're trying to find some granular somewhat verbose listing is painful to use. They're hard to navigate. They can be slow and sometimes painfully slow, both in their presentations, there's a lot of choices, and in their um, ability to find what you want and select it. Um, so we, as I spoke of, we're using this triple store driven list. It allows um, querying by multiple criteria. Uh, I want to find a diagnosis. It needs to contain the word mandibular. You have a variety of things, and the key thing is that it's very fast. It's almost, I mean, uh, we'll see in the demo, one second or less response to the, the queries or to the changes. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it's ontology-based. In the ontology, we can model these complex relations. We can then extract those through a set of tools and represent them in this triple store. Now, the RDB is, is kind of a traditional relational database schema. Um, it has a lot of lookup stuff, if you will, the program, the educational program, uh, the people involved in this, their positions, sites and settings. So Mark's uh, residents uh, work at varieties, not just at OHSU, Legacy, Providence. Um, in those sites, there are multiple settings. There could be the Hatfield Clinic, um, inpatient, outpatient uh, clinics, varieties of things. But the key... The central thing here, the big table you see here is the event. And there's some subtleties involved in this in that multiple residents can be involved in one of these surgical events. And they can play different roles. There could be the primary surgeon, a secondary surgeon, um, a teaching surgeon occasionally, or an observer. And we developed this such that in the current system and most systems, a single resident, say the primary, enters in the, the record and then annotates it with who was the secondary or the additional uh, residents. In ours, each resident will be entering in a separate event. They will select their own procedures and diagnoses. And you could say, well, this is somewhat redundant, but it actually, as you think through this, provides some wealth here in that, let's say we have three residents, a primary, surgeon, a secondary, and observer. Each of those is going to use the system and independently log the event from their perception. 
There's no guarantee they're going to pick the same findings. There's no guarantee they'll pick the same procedure. Um, uh, it may provide, may provide a wealth of research opportunity to understand do the perception of the surgical event change as residents proceed through, does a first year uh, or second year perceive it the same as a fifth or sixth year resident? So it's particularly structured to do that. Each resident will be responsible for entering their participation in the event. The other thing that kind of differs from like an EPIC or some of the traditional EHRs is that our procedures and our findings, our diagnoses, this is a many-to-many -many table. That is a, in like uh, EPIC, for example, I believe if you associate a finding or a diagnosis with an, an order, a prescription, um, you can only associate it with one. There's a one-to-one -one relationship in force. And this, you can associate a procedure with multiple findings, a finding with multiple procedures. And again, this provides perhaps a richness of potential differences depending on how it's logged. Um, enough on that. Um, so the triple store, this is kind of a key to this. The triple store is called that because it's predicated on this concept of a resource description framework, the RDF. This kind of underpins a lot of the semantic work um, and the standard is uh, approved by the World Wide Web Consortium. And it's a triple that is composed of three pieces. A subject, uh, so for instance, repair of the unilateral cleft lip. A predicate, it has a site and an object that this operates, the predicate operates in its upper lip structure. So everything that's in the ontology can be distilled down and represented in this set of triples. And our triple store is essentially the the um, storage really at the file system level of all of the triples that are inferred or stated in the underlying ontology. Now the advantage of this is much like the cache database underpinning EPIC is that it's fast. It doesn't have the um, uh, speed or penalty implications of doing multiple, multiple joins that an RDB may have. Um, and we'll see this in our demo. Now to make this happen, we essentially use a set of, again, uh, Apache libraries. It's called the Solar Lucene. This is a way of taking these triples and indexing them for very fast uh, reading and retrieval at the file system level. And then the Jenna framework, again, is a set of Java classes that are used to actually access this triple store and um, pass the data onto the GUI. We then have a set of uh, uh, tools that we have to use. We have to extract a subset from the SNOMED. SNOMED CT underpins all this. We take SNOMED CT as a source. We then add on to it through Mark's clinical knowledge and extend it. Uh, so we have a set of tools called the OWL tools. They're a, a wrapper around a whole set of Java stuff. It essentially lets a non-Java programmer use these tools and do things with them. Um, we have another one that's actually a similar one called ORT. It re allows you to extract the data out of the ontology and provide it ready to use for the triple store. Um, and then we have a, in our process here, we used a lot of custom Java to analyze stuff and get things uh, essentially going to begin with. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Mike now. So this. Uh, so as Jeff mentioned, we have a SNOMED CT uh, base that we started with to develop our ontology. Just because SNOMED is, is a pretty large, uh, well-established clinical, clinical terminology with 340,000 something odd concepts or something already represented in a, in a, in a sort of ontology, ontological model. So what Mark did with his domain, domain expertise is start to build out and extend on that model of SNOMED. So to build from the to build the granularity that we're talking about that this ontology supports. So to do that, Mark uh, used his favorite little uh, Snowflake browser here, which is a nice way to look at SNOMED, and he started looking at concepts and said, "Hey, reconstruction of mandible, that's in SNOMED. That's a one-to-one -one match for our, that we want for our ontology. That's what a clinician talks about at that level. It's important to a researcher or a clinician." Secondly, he would t find a concept like, "Yeah, reconstruction of mandible." However, reconstruction of mandible by distraction is a concept of granularity that we want to have in our database. So this was a, a partial match, which he then enhanced, and then we model in the ontology. And then third, 
hey, I'm, I want something really granular, like reconstruction of bony mandible alveolar process with bone graft, including BMP, you know, whatever that word salad is there. Um, so that in that case, we just modeled a brand new concept. So that's an entirely new granular. So you can see the level of granularity we're talking about in our concept. So that would be like one of the nodes in a subject object predicate triple. And so, like I say, we merged it all into an existing SNOMED extract. So we, we leveraged the size and the expressiveness of an existing SNOMED uh, subset. Uh, a really important piece, and I'll ask Mark to, if you want to comment on this as well, of the ontologies that we also developed, Mark developed. Um, uh, you can do the math here. Uh, uh, fi clinical finding and procedure educational categories. So these are brand new categories that we developed and incorporated into the ontology that are meant to allow us to capture the educational experiences that, uh, of the particular um, composed procedure and diagnosis right. entries like in the, in the these, log. These would be categories like malignant process. There's really no existing way, in, even in SNOMED, things aren't separated by whether or not it's malignant. That would be a sort of a finding category. But for, for an educator, I want to know if my students have managed malignant disease processes because that's a completely separate educational pyramid of knowledge. On the procedure side, I might want to ask, how are you doing in orthognathic surgery? Well, how do you define orthognathic surgery? SNOMED doesn't define what orthognathic surgery is. It's kind of a special niche thing. I have to define that. But I have accreditation requirements that need to show how much orthognathic surgery, jaw straightening surgery that my residents have done. And so I've built these educational categories to serve the accrediting bodies and to serve the educators. Um, the triple store is really to ser serve the researchers and to power our searches. But I've, we, we had to build these educational categories to serve the educational s side of things. And you'll notice that you see finding in all of our systems, procedure in all of our systems, but there are no outcomes. There's no way to know how people did. If I was to collect outcomes, then I'm collecting purely clinical data that isn't educational per se. So we can't collect outcomes, but we can infer a lot of information about outcomes based on patients who had one procedure uh, for a finding and then maybe had a second procedure that would be a procedure you would only do if the first procedure didn't work out very well. So we can infer a great deal about how procedures did scientifically by the actions that followed them. But there are no outcomes per se. Sure, and um, just to speak briefly to what he said about the on, how that is modeled in the ontology itself that drives all of this, um, each concept in our ontology um, is given at least one educational con class type relation based on our clinical expert over here. Um, just quickly, don't worry about the details of this, but this is basically the axiom. So if you remember my first slide about here's a generic axiom of an ontology, this is how we express our axioms, our procedure, our findings, and our procedures in our database. They're connected with our, our concept classes, which are the colored boxes, and the property types, which we have in between them. And they're associated within the log itself through, uh, uh, in the graphical user interface, they're associated through the event table that Jeff pointed out on the RDB. So in layman's terms, you can just think of this as this is how we express our finding and this is how we express our procedure. And just as an example of what this actually looks like using an, an example of an instance, um, we have our finding expressed up here. Unilateral cleft lip is an, is an oral maxillofacial surgery ontology concept. It has the anatomical site using a uh, class set from SNOMED of, of anatomy sites, upper lip structure. And it has the education category craniofacial. So similarly down here is the procedure that it's been associated with that in an event entry by a single role member in a surgical procedure. So you might have three different sets of these axioms for three people that were in the same room for the three, uh, for one particular event, if that makes sense. Um, and then just to throw back quickly to Jeff's triple, you can see subject, predicate, and object, an example of in the ontology how that looks. So that relationship there is, is a triple. Um, this relationship is a triple. And then similarly down here, we have another set of triples. So that's all you can start to imagine, all the, knowledge, all the granular sets of data that are generated from modeling using an ontology. 
This is a, a screenshot of our sort of beta version of the graphical user interface of a concept as it sits in there. So you can see we've got, um, this was our search box. So somebody typed in, you know, they wanted, they were looking for something mandibular related. Well, using the triple store model, it quickly gave them the option of selecting this uh, particular term. So you can see that it's got the anatomical sites, uh, the educational categories. You can move up and down the hierarchy that we have modeled in the ontology. So if you're interested in a more granular concept or a more general concept, you're not sure you're in the right place. Um, we also have uh, clinical domain definitions that we're developing for each one of these concepts that Mark's clinicians will help uh, fill out because we have a large set of terms to define. We have a uniform resource identifier, which is a generic um, ID number for this concept to mitigate any changes in the concept over time. So if we decide based on domain feedback that this name needs to change, we still map it back to this ID number so we don't lose any uh, information that we have linked to that particular concept. And importantly, we have our ICD-9, ICD-10 mappings and any related SNOMED concept ID mappings as well. I just want to say one thing too. If you look yeah. under congenital mandibular hypo hypoplasia, Synonym. you'll see other terms. Our system recognizes uh, synonyms, which is extremely important because what I call something, other people will call it different. I might say that I treated auriculotemporal syndrome. Others might call that gustatory sweating or Fry syndrome or von Fry syndrome. But the entity is what it is, no matter what label you put on it. It is this uniform resource indicator. And so our system recognizes synonyms, which is really important because it doesn't require then everybody around the country to call things, to all call this the same thing. Clinicians don't like that. They learned a certain way to call this and name this, and they won't change. So I give them the ability to use the synonym that they like and map it back to the actual label that we prefer, which really helps utilization. And let me point out that you just said synonym like eight times without doing cinnamon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is very good. pretty impressive. Very good, very good. But and if, you, and if you think about it, another, another language is just a synonym. So why not add German or Hindi or Farsi? Or it doesn't matter because this is what it is no matter what label you put on it. So this, you know, the idea is to extend it to other languages as well. Um, and then quickly, so we keep moving here. Um, just the ontology itself, it's curated in a protege ontology editor environment. Um, you can render it in these different interoperable languages. Uh, Jeff mentioned OWL a few times. That's the web ontology language, in case you're not familiar with that, which is a standard ontology modeling language. Um, we, we keep the subversions of it in a GitHub repository where we also have a term tracker, which is where we can collect feedback from the domain to, to figure out are, these, are we using the right level of granularity in the terms? You know, what does the domain say about our ontology so we're not just foisting this upon his domain? And currently we have, you can see we pulled 7,200 or so SNOMED classes in this initial poll based on the January 31st, 2014 SNOMED version. And we currently have 1,900 procedure concepts unique to the OMS ontology and about 1,800 finding terms as well. So 10,000 or so classes at this point, it's a pretty significant uh, corpus. And we've built new yes. about 70% of those. Yes, yes. I mean, a lot of the classes from SNOMED are, are not they're just, SNOMED didn't nearly model what we no, needed. No, no. It was a very, SNOMED sat up here and, and Mark has built out, you saw the one slide where I had the word salad. You know, that stuff is incredibly detailed and that's, that's how Mark's, his relationship with these spreadsheets he's been working on is pathological. So, <laughs> but you know, it works for us, so. Um, and then I think we'll just kind of all talk about the next steps from our particular viewpoints here. Mark, you want to? So for the next 30 days, hopefully in the next 30 days, we're going to deploy this uh, operating. It works. We'll show you the demo. We've got a couple of little things to fix and get, the, get it out to the residents in the next 30 days. They already have a log. It, it sits in eValue, which is uh, an application used to help manage training programs. And I, gotta, I want to get that data that's in eValue into this new log. So already our new log has a whole bunch of data in it and um, the residents don't lose the continuity, which would be very annoying for them to have to have their experience in multiple different logging systems. Um, we're gonna get a lot of feedback from our OHSU residents and make improvements. Um, we're gonna generate for the first time ever uh, an accreditation report um, uh, 
really detailed one from our log. That'll be one of our goals. Um, and um, hopefully, um, ideally, build reports and data visualizations which help a program director sit down with a resident during their six-month review and look at data visualizations like this, like this heat map of experience in certain anatomical areas in the area of bony surgery. There's no reason at all, because this is semantically rich log, there's no reason at all that we can't create averages for, say, um, surgical experience that involves operating on the eye socket. Our system knows what the eye socket is, every surgery. And um, we can create averages of experience and tell a resident, well, you're below average in eye socket surgery. <laughs> or you are really good in mandible and zygoma. You're a little deficient in mid-face, and you haven't done a lot of nasal surgery or been involved in surgical procedures that involve the site of nasal skeleton. That's really, really useful if you're a student or if you're an educator to know that you have these deficiencies. How can you correct a deficiency you don't know exists? And you have the power now to go to your program director who maybe hasn't done what they need to do and say, you know, I'm deficient in this area and I would like you to help me get education in this area. Is there a question in the back? Would these heat maps be weighted by whether the uh, trainee is a, the primary surgeon or secondary or observing? It could be, and that would be a good point um, to know. There's, there's almost a limitless depth of how detailed you can get, um, and the only question would be how much data do you want and how much makes a difference in your, in your educational planning. But there is a difference, let's say, and I wouldn't expect a first year to have a lot of experience in eye socket surgery, so that's totally legit. But they're compared to other first years. So their experience level is always compared to people like them. But this is in the future. So we want to know what questions you have, and then we're going to do a demo of the log. Uh, should I log in while you guys are chatting? I'll tell you what, I'll pass around. Uh, before we forget, um, I think we should do the acknowledgments now. I want to thank uh, the School of Dentistry, which has spent, um, helped us uh, fund this project with my startup research money, um, and Dr. Phil Maruka, the dean of our School of Dentistry, who has helped to extend that support. The NIDCR are Mike and Jeff's uh, sponsors for their fellowship. Uh, Melissa Handel is our, ontol is our uh, uh, ontology development group um, scientific leader, and she's been really helpful. The ACC, specifically Cole McCandish at the ACC, has really helped us set up the instance and get all the, the application framework stuff going. And Ted Bashor is an independent software uh, engineer uh, out of Wonder Lake Software who's written a lot of the extremely specialized, highly specialized code that involves using RDF and uh, these very specialized tools. So I'm going to log on while you guys take a question. Um, what I'll do here is that as part of this, we, you have to log in to enter an event. But we've also uh, made available, without logging in, the query tool. This is just to currently present it to our residents and just to allow them to play with the interface. So it drives against the triple store, just like if you were selecting the thing, is, is you, couldn't, you cannot save anything in the database. And so I'll pass this around. It, it scales relatively well to a pad. And... Without any training or anything, we'll just let you play with it by touching it and seeing what you get. And while Mark's logging in and doing a more formal um, present, and you can't break anything, so unless you spill your Coke on the pad. Yes? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so you were saying that two types of residents. So first year and say a sixth year, and theoretically they can they can call the case something different. Absolutely, the, 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 the diagnosis can be different and the procedure can be different. How would you then deal with that when it comes time to look at when someone wants to use this data now and then you know someone calls something a mandible fracture, you know someone calls something a subcondylar fracture, which is you know, part of the mandible. How how would you deal with that later on? Because essentially you'd you'd have two events there. 
And so, or if you're looking at, I guess. Um, so you'd have two events, each one associated with a specific resident. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we don't really know yet how we're going to handle this. So in the, your example, in that um, theoretical heat map, those would both map up into the same structure in that example. However, this is one of the very interesting parts for us is um, how do, what differences will show between a, a first year and a, and a fifth year or a sixth year. So how are we going to handle it? We don't know yet. I think that through its usage, as you say, during a six month or yearly review, uh, residents is found to be lacking in certain areas. It could be because they haven't had the exposure, the experiences. It could be because they're not logging it appropriately. And um, hopefully this will be part of a, 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 an iterative cycle of both education for the uh, resident themselves, for them to learn, I guess, the consensus on what they really did see. Um, and you would hope that it would become more consistent as the years in a program go by. Uh, but essentially, Time will tell. Right. Um, and I think I understand Mike's question in a, in a slightly different way. So two people might call things a different thing. But no matter what, there's no way to adjudicate that. So if a human says they saw something, then that's what they saw. That's what they did. If you have a conflict and you want to know what actually happened, you would then have to refer to the, the medical record. If you had some sort of conflict that you had to act. Now for you might be envisioning an accreditation body that wants to know what you've done. It's unlikely the accreditation body is going to care if you did a, an orbital floor fracture or a medial orbital wall fracture. The two things are so similar that from an accreditation standpoint, they are not um, necessarily important. And right, and right now, one resident can log whatever they want, and another resident can log whatever they want. You'll never, you can write what you want in the medical record, I can write what I want. Your version of what reality is can only be reconciled by you. Just have a follow up on that question. Uh, yeah. Sorry, before the next question, I know I interrupted. Um, but, I mean, I think your example highlights really one of the advantages of an ontology where if one student says they did. Uh, surgery on the mandible and another selects a more granular term like part of the mandible. The knowledge encoded in, in the ontology, there's a relationship between the mandible and all the parts of the mandible. So the knowledge encoded in the ontology will infer that surgery on the part of the mandible is the type of surgery on the mandible. And if you do a query for all surgeries on the mandible, the any more granular terms that are annotated will be returned for that as well because of the knowledge encoded in the ontology. So that's a great example of where the ontology can help roll up your data and, and inference to give you that type of result. Um, and there may be other types of, of disagreements that um, aren't handled in that way. But in the case of different levels of granularity that people annotate things, which is going to be common, the ontology is really valuable for resolving those types of things. So. If, so for each event, um, we have a resident who, in this case, is me. Um, I'm not the resident. Um, the event, the day took place, the date the event took place, this will be auto-populated. So the re this allows me to track how much experience a surgeon has. The resident will not have to enter it every time. It'll just auto-populate. Where it happened, the setting it happened in, what their role was in this educational event, were they the primary surgeon or the assistant surgeon, who will have a definition of that, but I can't adjudicate it. If somebody says they're a primary surgeon, then they are a primary surgeon. Um, primary assisting observer and teaching. And these all have specific definitions which will come up. The attending is Dr. Bell. We do collect a medical record number which is salted, hashed, encrypted in our database so that we can um, you know, return, what did you call it? A, Two way yeah, it's a two-way encryption two because way encryption. unlike the password, we're using very strong encryption on the actual password to get in. That's called one way. It's much like if you um, forget the password to your bank account, you can't, they can't tell you what it is. All they can do is set a new one for you. Same thing here. Uh, once you set a password and it gets encrypted, nobody has the power to read what it is other than if they try real hard at cracking. We're using an extremely sophisticated um, 
encryption for the password. The MRN is slightly different in that, again, for the potential accrediting uh, uh, questions. The, really, the record of truth in this, as Mark alluded, is in our case is EPIC. It's the EHR. So you have to have a link back to be able to get, if necessary, for uh, uh, re, uh, accreditation research back into the EHR as really the truth. And so we do use the MRN. It's two-way. That is, it's, it's encrypted going in, but you have to be able to read it. Yeah, um, there would be incentive for a resident to overstate their experience level. And, and the accrediting body needs to audit that and say, well, actually, no, you, you know. So there has to be, has to be a trail back to the EHR, or else the record can't be audited. It's just, it could theoretically be made up. And then instead of birth date, we collect birth year, which helps us know if it's pediatric surgery or adult surgery. But it's way, way simpler, which is an important accreditation thing. You have to know how much pediatric surgery a resident's doing. Um, but I don't need to know what day they were, birth, what they were, they were born on. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier just to select a birth year rather than a birth day. Is there a question? You mentioned before that when you plan to ship this out to other locations, you expect people to use different terms for the same thing or synonyms. Um, this actually, I don't know, to me this presents an interesting opportunity for a longitudinal study because if you present people with a training tool that has a fixed ontology, the language or use of language may change over time and you could track whether people start to use language in a standardized way because of your tool. Yeah, that's a great, that, that's something we never even thought of, but you're right, it's a, a lot of fun to think of the different things you can do with the data. So wrapped up here, we have our ad event details, which are hidden, but they're still there. And I've never done this in a live setting before. Uh, and this isn't our latest iteration, but would anybody like to throw out a diagnosis? Um, OK. So right now, you know, right now you'd have to, in existing logs, you'd have to go to a list and, and, and here, what I might do is just type in NASEP, and every thing that has that text in it comes up. And you can see that that took way less than a second. Now, this is extremely cognitively simple. If you make it simple for the trainee, they will enter very good data. If you make them search a list, they will enter whatever they can quickly find and get done with. We have one opportunity here to capture granular information. And if you make somebody go look at a list or go look at an abstract billing concept, you've missed your opportunity to actually collect what you want to collect. So there's your diagnosis of a perforated nasal septum. And um, so we might repair. Uh, here we just have fracture of nasal septum. Um, So uh, let's say that we repaired um, that fracture of nasal septum. Um, and then we have another diagnosis, like let's say we did an ameloblastoma of the jaw. And then we did, let's say, excision of lesion. And I type all these excision of lesion. I don't really see what I need, so I'll, I'll type in mandible. OK, there it is. And it was in the mandibular symphysis. So that's about as cognitively simple as you can make something using as few keystrokes as possible, because most of this will probably be entered on mobile devices. Then in order to complete uh, the transaction, the person has to associate the diagnosis that you see up here as D with the procedure. And we've made that very easy by having them just in drop-down menu, menu. So the perforation of nasal septum is associated with, with that. And you also see that populated down here. And the ameloblastoma is associated with the excision of lesion of mandible symphysis. And that's also populated down here. The resident can now close out the event. Um, in addition, they may not really know what something's called, or they might want to look at options, or the term finder will actually have a lot of possible uses. Um, but here we have a term finder, which is a tool that leverages all this information that doesn't necessarily have to be used to log a case. It can. Um, but we can use a filter type um, uh, mechanism to choose what you did. So a resident might say, gosh, I know I, I, know I did a trauma surgery. Um, 
I know I did a trauma. <laughs> oh, yeah, repair. Um, injury. So I know yeah. I treated something that was injured. I can't remember what he called it. It was injured. It was in the skeleton. Um, it was in the face, it was in the mandible, and it had something in there um, about coro something, so I'll type in CO. So here you can see all of the diagnostic findings that would be an injury of the skeleton, of the facial skeleton in the mandible that had that text string in it. And um, this allows people who aren't domain experts to search for things using greater categorization. Um, and you could do the same thing for procedures. Now you're left with a set of very limited options that are extremely cognitively simple to select from. And if you wanted to, you could enter them as an event um, in, your, in your log. Go into one. I want to highlight. So along with the searching, wait till we get one up. What would you? Uh, just wherever you were. Just okay. pick a procedure and go into it alone. So once you're here, you've kind of left the, the term search, and you actually have entered the tree, or if you will, the tree of the ontology. And now uh, what it shows here uh, is that, well, we're at the bottom. I'll put in um, mandibular hypoplasia. How about this one? Ah, there we are. No, I want one that has a narrower underneath it. So, yeah, mandibular hypoplasia works really. So uh, resident comes up, enters, ends up here, however they got here, mandibular hyperplasia. And they look at this, and this display tells them, if you look at this, there are more granular terms underneath this. And you see here bilateral hypoplasia, mandibular, and so there's four other that are um, narrower. And also, if you wanted to go up, you can go up to the disorder of the mandible, and you can start your way back down. So this allows a uh, resident to navigate through this very complex ontolo ontology, if you will, through narrower and broader categories until they can hopefully find what they want. And there's a lot of subtleties in here that will come in trading. So for instance, the, the uh, italics indicates that this itself, this order of jaw, go ahead and click on that, that's not... Uh, here we are. Where am I? Yeah, Great disorder of jaw. That is not selectable. The domain expert has deemed that this is too general to be used for a procedure. You notice up there that the select, um, let me see the, the laser. It's right there. Oops. That Sorry. the, um, Yeah. yeah, so select. You, anyway, the select is great. It couldn't be selected, but go back to where we were. Um, yeah, let's, oh, okay. let's, let's so, wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. Well, enough of that. There's a lot of subtleties in this interface to help guide the residents in the selection or make it easier for them to find more granular as yep. opposed to more general uh, terms. Do you think that this have potential usefulness in terms of quality, like surgeons being able to say the number of redo or second operations they have to do, or variation um, from a public health perspective of procedures that are only done in one region of the country that no one's doing anymore? A absolutely. You will have location data, and since we, we can track that which procedures are done on a single individual, it would be possible to infer that. When you collect information in a way that a computer can reason or perform logic on it, then lots of really interesting things become possible, uh, especially when it's national data. And you get into all kinds of curious questions that make people wonder and think and squirm a little bit. Judy. So Mark, don't you think that outcomes are educational? They are, but, um, but I can't, recording outcomes adds a, another layer of complexity that makes the project not succeed. And it's hard for me from an, a 
to get this through, I have to make it relevant to accreditation agencies, and they just about lost their lunch when I said I was going to keep a medical record number. Um, and so an outcome would um, be very diff it would make the project, uh, it would impound it. It would compound the difficulty, yeah, and it would impound the project. So I do think they're educational, but we can't use them because they, they present us with too much difficulty. And an outcome isn't known. Well, an outcome when? At six months? And who's going to log it? Yeah, yeah. You've defined all these other educational concepts. Yep. You could define educational concepts for outcomes, too. Yeah. One last question. Mark, one, you one talked more. about it. This outcomes is very interesting. Um, you talked about inferring outcomes. How do you account for loss of fo loss to follow up in this though? You can't count for loss of follow up. You can't count for the fact that the resident enters the wrong data. But if you have a big enough pile of data, then those sorts of things come out in the wash. Um, they, I'm not sure of the exact sti statistical, yeah, <laughs> statistical <laughs> term <laughs> that 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 didn't come out. But since you have to assume then that all procedures have a dropout rate, then the, the dropout rate becomes equally applied to every type of surgery you do, then it no longer can, that's not really an important component in looking at outcomes when you're looking at millions of data points. Have you done any usability testing with the residents yet, or is that what's happening in 30 days? That's what's happening in 30 days. Yeah, they'll find all kinds of issues and bugs and unfortunately they are really they, they they tell me immediately I think they do at least and um, Well, it's been a lot of work, so it's been a lot of fun talking to you about this labor um, and sharing it with you, and hopefully some of you will have some comments or recommendations for us based on this. And thanks a lot for coming and, and listening to our, our product project.